So the best time, let me make, is it recording? Yes. Okay. The best time to reach people is in a time of crisis, like a funeral. People are thinking about eternity. It's a good time to reach people uh, because a lot of times they're not even conscious that uh, it's appointed unto man wants to die. We all have to die. You can't get around that. But they're thinking about it at that time. And so it's a proven fact that's a good time to reach people. And I told these pastors in Mexico that I met with a couple of nights ago, the world is in a crisis. COVID, fear of war, uh, all of these things. And, you know, we're all, it's, it's like God has put the world in a time of crisis because that's the best time for us to reach people. Amen. So I, I, I want us to take advantage of the crisis and win as many people to Jesus as possible uh, because it's not an accident that what's going on is going on. And uh, so I think we should take advantage of it because people are very open to the good news when the every day they're bombarded with bad news. Mm. And so this is our opportunity to present good news to people. Many people are depressed. Many people are frustrated. Many people are discouraged. And God's given us a message of good news. And so... The crisis has opened an opportunity for us. It really has. And, you know, you cannot have a miracle without a crisis. Amen. You know, if you don't have a blind man, he can't be, have a miracle to see. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a hungry multitude, you can't have a miracle to multiply food to feed them. So every miracle is preceded by a crisis. And so we're facing a crisis, which is an opportunity for God to do the greatest miracle, the miracle of salvation. In John chapter 3, we all know this, but I want to read it just as a refresher. John chapter 3, verse 16. We'll start with 15. It says, uh, or 16, for God so loved the world. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read kind of slow because I want these words to jump off the page at you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. So my question is this, what does God love? What does God love? And in John 3, 16, the word of God tells us what God loves. Mm. For God so loved what? The world. The world. So, you know, we thought, the Christians and the church, we thought that, uh, that he loved the church. Yeah. You know, we think he loves uh, the church. He loves Christians. But the Bible says he loves the world. Amen. Not just the saved people. He loves the lost people. God loves those people that are trapped in the kingdom of darkness. Now, why does God love man so much? And even fallen man, why does God love saved man and fallen man so much? Because, you know, God never says in the word he loved his angels. As many mm. times as I've read the Bible, I've never found a place in the Bible where it says God loves his angels. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that God loves his plants or that God loves his animals. <laughs> nowhere in the Bible does it say God loves the nature that he created. But it does say that God loves man. The all of man, lost mankind, saved mankind. And all the way through the Bible, it, God expresses his love for mankind. Uh, that's That's powerful to me that 
his focus of love is not on all of his creation. His focus on love is you and me. Amen. And those that are in the kingdom of darkness. And by the way, the closer you get to God, the more you're going to love what he loves. Amen. I want to say that again. The closer that we become to God, the more we're going to love what he loves. Mm. And the more we're going to hate what he hates. You can always tell how close you are to God by what you love the most. Mm. You can tell how close of a relationship you have with God by what you love the most. See, when you're close to God, the more you become in a oneness with God, then you share like passions. So our passion should be the same as God's passion. Amen. And God's passion, we're told in Bible, is not plants, not animals, not things, not stuff, not blessings, but people. Yes. People. Yes. People. God has a passion and a love for people. And when you start loving people, that's a sign that you're close to God. You know, and, and I want to say, I've, I've really seen this, and I know Timo doesn't want me to say it, but I have to. But, you know, when Timo was in prison, he, he did things for people that, that most people wouldn't do. Mm. And even when he would share some of the stories of helping people that were dying that had cholera and, and he could have been infected with it. But every time he'd tell that story, he cared about those people so much that he even risked his life to help those people. And, and that really even boggled my mind. I, I'm not sure because I've never been in that situation if I do the same thing, but it does tell me that that was a sign of how much Timo loved God because his heart was the same as God's heart. Though they were mm -hmm. sick and diseased, Timo loved them and so did God. So, we need to remind ourselves because it's so easy to get off path. <laughs> it's so easy to get focused on, uh, on the wrong things. And those things aren't bad, but they're not the things that God wants us to really be focused on. And so we have to remind ourselves, what is God's divine cause for us? What is his cause for you? What is his cause for me? And his cause uh, is not to get blessings. I, I don't go through life seeking blessings. I go through life seeking God and the blessings will follow me. <laughs> you know, the, the, if we chase after God, the blessings will chase after us. But many times we go chasing the blessing. And in the midst of chasing the blessing, we miss God. And so I, I just want to go over what is God's cause for us? And his cause is not blessings. His cause is winning souls. What is the heart of God? Really, what is the, the heart of God is people? The heart of God is to win souls that are lost in the kingdom of darkness, to win them back to the kingdom of light. That's God's passion. That is God's heart. That is God's purpose, is to reach people, to win souls. We can get easily misled, and before you know it, we're, we're trying to chase blessings or prosperity or whatever. Mm. Mm. And, and we end up, that becomes the thing that we pursue, and in pursuing those things, we're not pursuing God. We're pursuing the results that we should get from pursuing God. Mm. So my question is, you know, why? Why is that God's cause? 
So I, I want to give you some things. You, you need to write these down. <clears throat> Here's God's cause. God's cause according to scripture, and I'll read the scripture later, but I want to give you the cause first. Number one, to reconcile man back to himself. God's cause is to reconcile man back to himself. Two, to reconcile man back to their purpose. Amen. Three, to reconcile man back to their true potential. In other words, to become all that God intends you to be. Amen. God has designed a purpose for you. It only fits you and no one else. Amen. But outside of being reconciled to God, you will never fulfill the true potential that God has for you. And four, God wants to reconcile man back to their kingdom dominion. God wants to reconcile man back to their kingdom to min dominion, to give man back what he gave Adam in the garden. <laughs> mm. And all of these causes of God is built around the word to reconcile. And so God's number one cause is to reconcile man back to himself. God's number one cause is to reconcile man back to himself. And that's called salvation. So if salvation is God's number one cause, what should be our cause? What should be our focus? Salvation. Souls. Yeah. Now, reconciliation. And I know that y'all have read your Bible, so you know that's a Bible term. And right. the number one place that we read it is in 1 Corinthians. I mean, 2 Corinthians. Reconciliation is used to describe what God wants to do. To reconcile men back to himself, to reconcile men to their purpose, to reconcile them to their potential and to their kingdom dominion. So if God's assignment is reconciliation and we have a close relationship with god what would be our assignment mm. if we have like passions as god and yes. we love what god loves and hate what god hates that close relationship would give us the same passion and the same assignment which is souls reconciliation mm. our purpose is to reconcile man back to himself that's god's purpose now the term reconciliation <clears throat> have you all read that in the bible or am i throwing a new term out there to you yes we have okay good so reconciliation it means to con it's like to conceal to concile, to consolidate. I, I don't know about in Africa, but in, in the US, when you have a, a checking account with yes. a bank and, and the bank has a number, right? Of what your balance yes. should be. And then you have a number of what the balance should be, right? And yes. at the end of the month, you reconcile your statement. Mm. In other words, you want to make your statement the mm. same as the bank statement. Mm. Yes. And that's called to reconcile your account. See, at the end of the month, when it's the same, it's consiled. <laughs> it's consiled, it's the same. But as you go through the month and you write checks, at the end of the month, you need to re- Consile the account to make it the same as the bank account. And that's called reconciliation, <laughs> to reconcile. And these terms are important. The term reconciliation is important because it describes God's program 
for mankind. Mm. Reconciliation. I'm, I'm really, I'm going slow because I'm trying to plant some things in your mind. Reconciliation describes God's program for mankind. To concile means to make one. So you make your bank account the same as the bank account at the bank because you made it one. To consolidate means to make one. You can, some people take, they have too much debt and they consolidate all of their debt into one payment. That's, you consolidated all of your debt. And so the Bible talks about reconciliation, to reconcile man. Yeah. We're going to get there. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. <laughs> Imagine God is the bank and we're out of balance. God was reconciling the world to himself so mm -hmm. that the imbalance would become one with God. So God wants to reconcile the world to be made one with, Amen. To, to reconsolidate. And so the Bible says Christ was reconsolidating the world to himself. Do you know, nowhere in the Bible, I thought this is interesting. Never did God say he wanted to consolidate man. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says he wanted to reconsolidate man. <laughs> There's a big difference because reconsolidate means at one point you were already one with him. Mm. But he had to balance the checkbook. He had to take care of some debt mm. so that he could reconsolidate. We used to be one with God. But it got broken off in the garden. Mankind was broken off. At one time, we were consolidated. And mankind was one with him. So God's greatest purpose is to reconcile man back to himself. And to do that, he gave his only son. So that he could create the reconciliation. He had to take care of the debt so that we could be reconciled with him. Amen. Now, now the church, a word for the church, uh, it's, it's the, the Greek word is ekklesia. It means called out ones. And so the church is made up of the reconciled people. Those are called out and appointed by God to have a ministry of reconciliation. That's the church. The church is a group of people called out and appointed by God to have a ministry of reconciliation, rec helping him reconcile the world to himself. So I want you to look so you, we can see what our appointment is. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And, and this is our appointment from God. Right here in the word of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me start with verse 13. Uh, I mean, the whole chapter. Well, really, the whole Bible is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> But let me start with 13. I just I like this verse 13. It's always been one of my favorite. Paul said, if we're out of our mind, it's for God's sake. <laughs> but if we're right in our mind, it's for you. In other words, if, if, if you think we have a right mind, it's so that we can reach you. But if you think we're crazy for Jesus, that's for God. Because God loves people that are crazy for Jesus. 
Amen. Yeah, he's a fool for Christ. And by the way, you're going to be a fool for somebody, so you might as well be a fool for the right one. <laughs> yes, sir. Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. The love of God compels us. This is talking about evangelism. God's love compels us because one died, therefore all are dead. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Now, here we go. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Therefore, we once regarded Christ in this way, and we do no longer. In other words, the Jesus that they saw when Jesus was on earth was the Jesus of a beard and sandals. But, but you know that we serve more than a Jesus of beard and sandals, I hope. <laughs> yeah. We, we serve much more than... The, the Jesus that, that they regarded in the way from a worldly point of view. You got to understand that when they, when they were with Jesus, they weren't really 100% sure he was the son of God. He even had to ask them, who do they say that I am? <laughs> so this is now we don't see you as merely beard and sandals. We see you as Christ the King. Amen. And then he said, verse 17, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Hallelujah. The new is from, from law to grace. Yes. We went from the old covenant to the new covenant. All of this is from God. Look at verse 18. This is so good. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us what? The ministry of reconciliation. Whew. Do you get that? Do, do you know who handed you the baton of that ministry? Jesus himself said, here, I'm giving you, I'm handing you the baton to take over this ministry of reconciliation. That God, verse 19, that God was reconciling the church to himself. Huh? Mm -mm. Uh, the thank world. You. Thank the you, world. Sylvia. No, no, no. He wasn't reconciling the church. <laughs> he was reconciling the world. Hmm. The people in the kingdom of darkness. Amen. The whole world. He's reconciling not just those that are saved. He's reconciling who? The whole world. You got, you got to see that. You ought to mark that in your Bible. Isn't God it? was reconciling the world. In other words, he was taking care of the debt because it was out of balance and bringing everybody into balance with God, the whole world. You'll get the impact of that later, I think. Hallelujah. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Am I right? Yes. Or did he just die for the sins of the Christians? No way, the world. Yeah. Because the Bible says, in that while we were yet sinners, <laughs> Christ he loved died for us. us. You know, before you even knew you had sinned, before you even knew what sin was, Jesus died for you. Amen. He already paid the price. Amen. He already reconciled the account. Mm -hmm. that, that Christ reconciled the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. 
you should highlight that little piece right there. <laughs> he, look, not counting the world's sins against them. And he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. He's balanced the accounts, but he's given us a ministry for mankind to be reconciled. Then look at verse 20. Here's your purpose. We are therefore, therefore, underline therefore in your Bible. We are therefore. What is therefore, therefore? Yeah. <laughs> What is therefore, therefore? It's referring back the therefore to the ministry of reconciliation we've been called to, right? Yes. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Whew. Wow, you're going to get that before I'm done. <laughs> we are, we are Christ's ambassadors look at this next part this ought to excite you so much you can't sleep at night <laughs> we are therefore christ ambassadors as though god were making his appeal <laughs> through us <laughs> wow when we go out and reach souls, God is making his appeal through us because we're his ambassadors. Amen. We implore you on Christ's behalf. See, now he's acting like an ambassador, right? Yes. Now he's saying, I'm acting like an ambassador. I implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be mm -hmm. sin for us, so that in him we might become, my favorite verse, the righteousness mm -hmm. of God. Whew. What? That, let me take those verses we could spend three months just, just on those verses. It is so power packed. And I'm going to try to unfold just a little bit of it and let you unfold the rest of it on your own. But I want some things to point out <clears throat> that God reconciled in verse 18. He reconciled us to himself. And he gave us, as a result of reconciling us, a ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. Mm -hmm. Not counting people's sin against them. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. And he said, we're committed to the message of reconciliation. So we're Christ ambassadors, and he's making his appeal to humankind through us. So our assignment is the ministry of reconciliation. What yes. better ministry can you have? Listen, <laughs> I mean, really, what? if I'm going to do ministry, I want to do the same ministry Jesus did. Amen. You know, you know, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew and Mark, the Great Commission, you know, of, of evangelism, right? You're all familiar with the Great Commission. So what's interesting, why we call it the Great Commission is because that was God, Jesus, sending us out to be ambassadors. But you notice it's not the Great Mission. <laughs> It's not the great mission. What is it? Commission. Commission. Mm. 
So co-mission is your mission together with someone else. Yes. I don't want to be on a mission. I want to be on a co-mission. <laughs> I want to be on the same mission he's on. Oh my, oh my, oh my. I don't want to develop another mission. I want that's to partner true. with his mission. And that's why it's called the co-mission. Mm. Oh. A mission together with him. Co-parenting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. So we're commissioned with Jesus. And he says, therefore, you are Christ ambassador. So now I'm going to break it down a little bit. We are being sent out by the government of God to tell every human being all over the world that they can come back to God and be reconciled and come back to the citizenship that is rightfully theirs in the kingdom of God. The more you love God, the more you love the people that God loves. Amen. So as you develop a relationship closer with God, you're going to realize I'm a, I have been sent out by the government of the kingdom of God. Yes. Because you know what an ambassador is, don't you? Yes. An ambassador is an appointed political leader by a governmental leader to go to a foreign land or a territory to represent the country in that yes. foreign area. Whew, help me, Jesus. <laughs> See? Everywhere I go, I represent a foreign land called the kingdom of God. I have been sent out by the government of the kingdom of God as an ambassador, as an ambassador from God's kingdom mm -hmm. to represent him. Do you know what the word represent means? It means to represent. Yes. I don't want to present God. I want to represent God. Mm -hmm. I'm a representative of the kingdom of God. So I want to represent Jesus. Represent Jesus. Now, now if, if you want to come to the United States from Kenya. You have to go to the American embassy in Kenya, right? Yes. So yes. to get an American visa, you go to the American embassy. You don't go to the Kenyan embassy. See, you have to go to the embassy of the country that you want to enter. Mm, mm, See, mm. You, you're trying to leave the country you're in to go mm. to a foreign country. And to do that, you have to go to the embassy that represents the country that you want to go to. Hey. So you, you can't go to the Kenyan oh government my. and say, I want to go to the United States. They go, we can't help you. We have no power over the United States. You have to go to this little place in Kenya mm. yes. called the mm. embassy. And that little territory, it's, it's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of America on earth. <laughs> oh, Just like it is in Lord. the United States. You see, it's got the same power, the same authority, the same... As a matter of fact, yes. if you wage war against that kingdom, you have waged yes. war against the entire oh, United Lord. States. Mm. You, you, you better not mess with... You don't, you don't yes. mess with an embassy that represents the kingdom of God. You have come against the entire kingdom of God if you do that. And if you want to go to that place, you have to go to that embassy. 
because the country that you want to enter determines the, the embassy that you have to go to to get a visa. <laughs> you can have a passport, but if you don't have a visa, you're not coming. <laughs> hey. And Jesus, he's already given you a passport. Oh, Jesus. When he died on the cross, he gave you a passport. He died for the sins of all humanity, but you ain't got a visa yet. <laughs> uh, I hope you're hanging in. See, if, if you want to go to heaven, you can't go to the embassy of Allah. Come on. If you want to go to heaven, you can't go to the embassy of Buddha. Come mm. on now. Listen, Come on if you now. want to go to the kingdom of God, you've got to go to the embassy that represents the kingdom of God here on earth. Yes, sir. And you know who you're going to talk to when you go there? You're going to talk to the ambassador. Mm -hmm. Because it's only the ambassador that can give you a visa so that you can come into that country. Oh. And heaven is God's country. And the only way you're going to get into God's country is to go to his embassy to get a visa. Are we together? Yes. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way. <laughs> there ain't no other way. Look, if you want to come into my country, if you want to exercise the, the passport that I gave to you at Calvary, when your sins were forgiven, you're going to have to go to the embassy and speak to my ambassador, and Jesus is your ambassador in order to get a visa so that you can enter into that kingdom. <clears throat> You know, Jesus said this, and nobody else ever said this, by the way. Buddha didn't say this. Allah didn't say this. None of the other religious people said this. He said, I am he who came down from heaven. Wow. <laughs> you know what he said? He said, I'm the only one that's ever done this. Yes. I am he who came down from heaven. Here's what he said. I'm here to represent my kingdom. And I left heaven to come here to represent the kingdom of God. And that's what we're called to do. And he's the only one that came down from heaven. So if you're going to get into his country, you're going to have to go to him. And by the way, Jesus is the original ambassador. But he passed that baton over to you and said, now, guess what? I'm giving you the same authority as I had. All authority is given unto you so that Amen. you can be an ambassador like I was on earth. Now you can represent the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. So you have to go to the ambassador from heaven to get your visa. Even if you have a passport. Jesus is the only way into his country. Now, I want you to think about this. This is going to be different. And it's going to boggle your mind. But if Jesus died for the sins of the world, then Jesus has legally given us all citizenship to heaven. He's already died for the sins of the world. But you have to do something. You have to do your part. You have to go to the ambassador to get your visa. Even though you have a legal right to go to heaven, without a visa, you can't get in. Because your immigration rights were canceled in Genesis chapter 3. Hmm. Your immigration status was canceled in Genesis chapter 3. So you have to go to the ambassador, Jesus, to get your immigration status reinstated <laughs> back to the original status of the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and the only way you can get that reinstated is to go to the only um, one ambassador that represents the kingdom, and that's mm -hmm. Jesus. 
He's the only way. So you go to that ambassador, the price has been paid. You speak to the ambassador, he stamps your visa, gives you a visa, you're allowed to go to heaven. Now, when you go to the embassy, see, did, did you know that the president of Kenya, as rich as he is, as powerful as he is, he can't come to the United States. He has to have a visa too. <laughs> mm. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't yeah. matter how powerful you are. Yeah. Everybody goes in the same way. <laughs> That's true. Everybody wow. has to get a visa. Mm. Doesn't matter how big, how important, how popular, how yes. rich you are. None of that matters. You see, many people are going to say, Lord, Lord, I've cast demons out. I've done miracles. He's going to say, no, no, no. You didn't have a visa. You didn't have a visa. God sent his son to be his ambassador. Now, now I want you to catch this because we're talking about evangelism. We must as the church, as the embassy of God on earth, we must take up with zeal our assignment. We must take up with zeal <clears throat> our assignment. We are the embassy of God on earth as it is in heaven. And he has given us a job of reconciliation and called us ambassadors. And we have laid that assignment down, pursuing a lot of other stuff. <clears throat> you know, the ambassador of the United States is assigned, well, the president assigns what we have is called the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State assigns ambassadors. But when the president assigns the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State assigns an ambassador. It is as though the president assigned that ambassador. And do you know the ambassador there in Kenya, he doesn't speak of his own authority. He doesn't speak of his own will. The ambassador only represents the president. He only speaks the heart of the president. He only acts as though the president would act. That's why Jesus said as an ambassador, I do the things that you do and say the things that you say. I'm your ambassador, God. I represent you. So I do the things and say the things that you say and do. Mm, Jesus, amen. Jesus was the chief ambassador. Mm. So as the chief ambassador, now I want you to get this, the president, God, tells the chief ambassador, Jesus, assign other ambassadors. And that chief ambassador, the secretary of state, get this, is responsible for every ambassador that he places in a foreign land. All of the power of the nation that he represents is behind that ambassador. And the chief ambassador has to make sure, just like the embassy in the United States, that every ambassador, the ambassador of the United States in Kenya, is protected. God's protection, God's provision, God's direction, mm. God's blessings comes from the president to every ambassador that represents him in a foreign land. God says, Amen. don't worry. <laughs> I got this, okay? Yes. All you do is represent me. I'm going to take care of everything as you're in that foreign land. 
representing the kingdom of God. I'm going to meet your needs. I'm going to get you a place to stay. I'm going to provide your food. I'm going to give you safety. I'm going to give you protection. As long as you're on foreign soil, my kingdom, every bit of it stands behind you. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Jesus. Amen. I mean, that, you know, if that doesn't oh, excite my. you, you don't, you don't understand mm -hmm. the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> is the secretary of state uh. and his ministry is reconciliation and now it, you can look at it as god as the president jesus as the secretary of state and all of the ambassadors underneath him you and me and all over the world hallelujah have been given the ministry of reconciliation so the man that you meet mm. when you go to the embassy there in Kenya to get a passport, you're not going to meet with the president. Yes. And you're not going to meet with the secretary of state. But it as, as though you have spoken to the president. Amen. Because Amen. he's there not on his authority, but the authority of the president. Mm. The ambassador in Kenya is representing the president of the United States. As an ambassador of the kingdom of God, you represent the kingdom of God and have all authority and all power behind you, standing there, protecting you, providing for you, giving you authority, giving you power to do whatever God wants you to do. You're his ambassador. So when the ambassador gives me permission to enter the United States, it's just like the president did. Mm. That's a lot of power given to an ambassador. That's true. And we are to carry the message of reconciliation to all men. Amen. Why? Because God has covered the sins of the world and they don't know it yet. And we have to take the ministry of reconciliation to reconcile those accounts. God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only oh. begotten son for the world, yes. not the church, not the Christians. He gave his son for the world, that whosoever, whosoever, whosoever would be reconciled would get eternal life. Now, as a, as a Kenyan citizen, you can have a clean record. You can be a nice person. You can be generous. You, you can be a great individual. But that doesn't give you access to the United States. It's not how good you are. It's not how bad you are. Mm -hmm. It's whether or not the ambassador decides to give you a visa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you really got to, you got to appeal to this ambassador. And a lot of people have gone to get a visa to come to the United States from Kenya. And, and they've got a clean record. They got all this. And they go, no, you can't have it. So we're forgiven. And, you know, in 1 John, a lot of people ask this question when you talk about grace. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. <clears throat> and a lot of people say, well, that verse means that to be forgiven, you have to confess your sins, right? Yes. Yes, yes. So in order to be forgiven, you have to confess. But if the Bible teaches you've already been forgiven, what are you confessing? Mm. <laughs> if you've already been made the righteousness of God, what do you have to confess? And people have taken 1 John 1, 9 out of context. You see, 1 John chapter 1 was not written to Christians, but to lost people. The first chapter was really written, and I don't have time to go into this, to the agnostics. And the agnostics believed they had no sin. And so John was writing to the agnostics. Remember, he said, if you say you have no sin, <laughs> you're not of God. And he was trying to tell the agnostics, you do have sin, but you need to come to God. You need to get a visa. <laughs> and, you know, it says, if you confess your sins, I've told you what confess meant 
remember, you can't forget these terms or you're going to have bad theology. The word confess means to say the same thing that God says. Oh, yes. So if you confess your sins, are you going, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I did. Oh, God, I, I shouldn't have done this. Well, God already knows you did it. <laughs> you don't have to inform God, right? Are you trying to tell God, bring him up to date? <laughs> God is more up to date than you can possibly be. He's beyond your date. God's already in next week. So you don't go to God and say, I'm confessing my sin. God, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but yesterday I did this and I need to be forgiven. No, the word confess is to say the same thing God is saying. So the Bible is saying you need to go to God and say, hey, God, I agree with what you say about my condition that I need you. I need your grace. I need to come into your grace. Amen. And then once you come into your grace, then you're a Christian and you're the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you want to come into America, you have to go through the process. You have to go to the ambassador. You have to get a passport. So I'm saying all that is we need to activate our passion for people so that we can act like Jesus act when he was here, which was a love for all people, all people. Remember when he was on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they've done. Who was he talking to? <laughs> he was talking to the people that killed him. And what did he say? Father, forgive them. Yes. Take away their sin, mm -hmm. even though they killed me. Do you think God answered that prayer, or do you think Jesus was just hoping he did? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus forgave the world. But you've got to get your passport. Yeah. Because of the fall of man, you've lost your immigration status. And you have to be hmm. reinstated. Adam lost it through the first Adam, but the second Adam, Jesus, he reinstated that citizenship. Now, we do need to, uh, you know, you go to the embassy and you get your citizenship, and that's where you get your, but do, do you know, now get this, you are a traveling ambassador. <laughs> you don't have to be at the embassy. You can be at the market and stamp somebody's passport. <laughs> Amen. You don't have to be at the, listen, everywhere you go, you should be stamping passports. Say, yes, yes, come into the kingdom. Come in, I represent Jesus. Come into the kingdom. Now you need the embassy, right? Because yeah. at the embassy, that's, that's where you learn to assimilate to your new country. See, hey. you, you got to go to the embassy because that's where you learn the kingdom language. <laughs> you, you've got to learn the mother tongue. <laughs> you, you need to be at the embassy so that you can assimilate into the kingdom and you can learn about the new culture that you've just come into. So yes, mm. the church, the embassy <laughs> is important. But you can be anywhere to stamp somebody's passport. First Corinthians 5 says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for all of us. Wow. That's, that's, that's so powerful. God used Jesus to bring us back into right relationship with the government of heaven. Amen. The redemptive work of Jesus is to bring us into right relationship so that we can reach mankind. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go add a little something to this, so get ready. Because <clears throat> we're talking about loving people, right? Evangelism comes out of loving people. The yes. love of Christ compels yes. you, right? Out of 2 Corinthians. Yes. So God loves man. We know that, right? But I, I want you to think about yes. this. Why does God love man? That's a good question. Why does God love man? 
So here's this. So you're going to have to really think on this. God loves man because he loves himself. God loves man because he loves himself. And I know this is going to throw you off. You just got to hang with me. You'll get it. If you get the revelation. God loves man and created man so that he could see himself all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. God loves man and created man so that he could see himself all the time. When God sees himself, he loves himself. <laughs> you know, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. 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 The heavens, now listen to this the heavens declare the glory of God, mm. but you possess it. Amen. <laughs> the heavens declare it, but you possess it. Mm. It's a big difference. <laughs> it's one thing to declare it, but it's another thing to possess it. You possess the glory of God. Nature just declares it. You see, when God sees a bird, he doesn't see himself. He sees his handiwork. When God looks at nature, he doesn't see himself. He sees his handiwork. Amen. But when God looks at you, he sees his own yes. image and likeness. Yes. Oh, I hope you get this. Mm. Mm. He made you in his image and likeness so that when he sees you, he can see himself because he loves himself. And when he sees you, he loves himself because he's seeing himself. Amen. Amen. Are we together on that? Yes. God created man mm. Mm. so that God could love himself through man. You got to think about that. You're the only thing that was created in his image. He didn't die for the birds. He died for you because you were made in his image. And you can do nothing to get God to love you, by the way. You can't become so lovely that God's going to love you more. Because if God loves you more, that means he loves himself more. God can't love himself more. He is love. He's perfect love. And so you, you can't say, well, I'm going to be good enough and get God to love me. God loves a lost man as much as he loves you. He loves you as much as he loves the prostitute on the street or the drunkard that's laying in a gutter. Yes. Because God loves himself. Well, we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Why? Because he loves himself. When you see a human being, you should see an image of God. Yeah. And the target of our love. I'm going to say that again. When you see any human being, you should see an image of God and the target of our love. If, if you ever have a revelation of God's unending, boundless, powerful, perfect love for you, you will realize that you could never be a loser because God's not a loser. See, you'll never fail because God's never a failure. Amen. You will always succeed because God is always successful. So when God sees you, he sees himself. How can he see himself as a failure? How can God see himself as a loser? Mm. When he looks at you, he sees himself. You can never lose. You can never fail. And, and let me throw this out there. <clears throat> The redemptive price, the redemptive price for man was not set by Satan. Mm. 
the redemptive price for mankind was not set by Satan. See, the church thinks that the devil told God, if you want them back, this is the price you have to pay. No, the devil doesn't dictate the price. God dictated the price of redemption. Amen. God set the price himself. Not the devil. Because in the garden, God said, the day you eat it, you're going to die. <laughs> I'm setting the price. <laughs> the price of your disobedience is death. The devil doesn't set this price. I'm setting the price. This is God speaking. You will die. The day you eat it, I'm going to make sure you die. I'm setting the price. The devil's the tempter, not the killer. Our disobedience is the killer. Are we together on that? Yes. The devil didn't set the price for redemption. And God loved himself so much. He decided to pay the price so that man wouldn't have to die. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> he said, look, look, I set the price and I'm going to pay it for you because I love myself so much. I don't want you to have to die. You and I activated the price. We activated the price of death and we're supposed to pay it. But God, he did nothing wrong and never sinned, but he said, I'm going to pay that price for you. You know, God did not die for man because he felt sorry for man. God died for man because he loved himself. He created you to love you. He created you to love you. God loves man because Jesus came to restore God's image back to man. <laughs> he wants God's image to be restored back to man. Man distorted the image in the garden. And so that when God looked at man, he didn't see himself. And God said, I love myself. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to reconcile man. Because I love myself and I want to look at man and see myself again. And so I'm going to restore man back to that original image and likeness of myself. And so after the fall, when God looked at man, he, he didn't see himself. <laughs> man lost that image. And God had to clean up the image. God cleaned up the image of man. So that he could see himself again. He redeemed man back to himself so that he could see himself again. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 says. God was in Christ reconciling the image of man back to himself. Have I lost you? No. No, no, no. Are we still together? Yes. Yeah. You know, God, <laughs> listen, now listen, God wants to look good. Hmm. God likes to look good. Right? Yes. And when you look good, God looks good. <laughs> mm. So God wants you to do good so that you look good. That's oh my. True. So that That's God true. looks good. Mm. And we don't want to spoil the image of God. You know, in John 14, 15, listen to this. I don't have time to really get into this, but Jesus said this. If you love me, you'll obey me. Yeah. Now, now, yes. now, now there's a twist that the church puts on this. See, we mm -hmm. turn a blessing into a curse. Yeah. I hope you get this because I don't have time to expound on it. But if you love me, you'll obey me. Here's how it's preached today. You don't love God. You don't love God, because if you loved him, you'll obey him. Now, now, they, now they're condemned. Now they're beat up. 
Now they think they're under conviction, but they're really under condemnation. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> but let me tell you what God is saying. See, you got to put it in, in, into the context. He's saying, if you love me, of course you're going to obey my commandments. <laughs> mm. See, all you got to do is love me. And if you love me, obedience is going to be right there. Amen. But we flipped it around and say, ah, oh, you don't love God. God is saying, no, look, just fall in love with me. You'll obey my commandments. You know what it says in 1 John 5, 3? He said, my commands are not burdensome. Whew. Wow. My commands are not burdensome. How many times have you heard a preacher preach the commands of God and they just create a burden in your heart? When you love God, his commands aren't burdensome because you're going to obey him and his commands become a blessing, not a curse. God's commands are a blessing. All you've got to do is love him. And when you love him, obedience is natural, right? Because you're made in his image. You're made in the likeness of God. And that got distorted. And so God reconciled you back to him and restored his image back into you. So when he looks at you, he sees himself. And he wants you to look really good so that he looks good to the world. Because you represent him. Represent. Amen. Represent. You're an ambassador. You represent the kingdom of God. You got to look good. He wants you to look good. And you know what? You don't have to try to look good. He's already made you look good. You just have to join in with him. Remember, it's a commission not a mission. Yeah. You just want a commission yeah. with him. Hey, look, I look good. You know, he makes us look good. He really does. He makes us look good. You know, I mean, he calls us to do things that, you know, the, the world thinks we're smart, but we're not. He just made us look smart. Amen. <laughs> you know, God just has a way of doing that. Listen, whatever your job is, if you're a teacher, if you're a mechanic or whatever you are, that's not your real job. No, no, that's not your real job. That's just the place that you hang out as an ambassador. <laughs> See, your real job is an ambassador at the school where you teach. Your real job is an ambassador at the mechanic shop. Your real job is an ambassador at the market that you work at. Because what we're really called to do is to be ambassadors. In, in, in Psalms 8, 4 through 7, let me read it to you. You can write it down, read it when you, you know, later on. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Now, let me read that again, and I'm going to translate it for you. What is man that you are mindful, that your mind is full of him? What is man that your mind is so full of man? The son of man that you care for him. And you've made him a little lower than heavenly beings. That word heavenly beings is the word Elohim. Do you know what Elohim is in the Hebrew? It's the name for God. So the, it's a very poor translation. You were made uh, a little lower than the angels. That's the very poor translation. The original word is Elohim. In other words, you were made just a little lower than God. You were made a little lower than God and, and he crowned you with glory and honor. But here's, here's the point. What is man that, that God's mind is so full of man? And this is God asking David a question. All God thinks of is man. His mind is full of man. He thinks about you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. His mind is full of you. Amen. Imagine the creator of the ends of the universe with omnipotent power, unending, unbeginning power can think of thought and change the entire universe. His mind is full of you. Mm. While you were yet a sinner, his mind was full of you. Mm. You know, they recently discovered a new galaxy. You know, a galaxy is a whole solar system. 
Do you know there's over 60 billion galaxies? The Milky Way galaxy is one galaxy. Every galaxy has their own sun, their own planets, their own, all of that. 60 billion known galaxies. And do you know that God's mind is not full of the galaxies? His mind is full of you. Oh, me Amen. <laughs> he's not thinking Amen. about all that he's created. Amen. He's focused on you. Mm. He's focused on you. You know why you're so valuable? Because you were made, get this, a little lower than God. In other words, you are mm. God's offspring. You're his offspring. Mm. He looks at you, he sees himself. When I look at my boys, I see myself. You know why? You're my offspring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know it? And when God looks at you, he sees his babies. He Amen. sees himself. He sees his DNA. He looks at you and he sees himself because you're his baby. You're his babies. We're all his babies. You, you know, you can't, you can't love God and hate man. You, you can't. You know, the Bible says that you say you love God and you hate man, then the love of God is not in you, right? First John. Yes. So, you know, in other words, you're lying. You can't say, look, I love, I love God, but I don't love man. Because God loves himself. And that's why God loves us. And we love God. And inside of every man is the image of God. So who do I love inside of that man? Mm -hmm. I'm loving God. You know, if you, don't, if you don't love other people, you don't love yourself. If you hate someone, you hate yourself. In Ephesians, this is how Paul said. If a man hates his wife, he hates himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't hate the wife because inside of the wife is the image of God. Listen, don't you ever trust anybody that, that uh, hates someone. <laughs> Some, someone hates his wife. Don't ever trust that man. That's for sure. Yes. He's hating himself. He's a self-hater. He's self-destructive. Yeah. Never, never trust a man that doesn't love his wife. This man hates himself. Listen, we're God's babies. And you know what God did? He gave us honor and authority and mm. glory. He said, you're my baby. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you earth. That, that's going to be your playpen. I'm going to give earth to my babies. That way, y'all just go ahead and rule and take dominion and take authority and govern my planet earth, would you? <laughs> I'm going to give it to you so you can rule over it. Amen. Because God loves his babies. Because when he loves his babies, he's loving himself. You see, we get too busy making money we get too busy building a future. We get too busy with all this other stuff when what we ought to be busy about is what God's busy about, which is souls. But we get busy about all these other things. And we all say we love God, but do you love people? You got to love people. When you love God, you love people. Yes. <clears throat> because we're made in his image. The only war that God declared was war on sin, not on people. That's powerful. God does not hate the sinner. He hates the sin. Yeah. He died for the sins. God never declared war on anyone. He only declared war on sin. And the only war that God died for was in the war of sin. God loves all mankind and we should be busy loving people and being an ambassador and stamping passports everywhere we go but you know we become like James and John right 
Remember James and John? They were terrorists. <laughs> James and John, they were terrorists. You, you know the story. You yeah. know, they go to Jesus. They say, Jesus, there's this group over there. They're not even a part of us. And, you know, they're, they're using your name and, and casting out demons and miracles and stuff. And, you know, they're not even a part of our clan. So, so God, call fire down on them and burn them up. Kill every one of them. Mm. <laughs> That's a terrorist. <laughs> hey. They were acting like terrorists. And Jesus corrected. Remember what he said? He said, where did you get this spirit from? <laughs> He said, this, this spirit that you're talking from, it's not my spirit. Yeah. That this isn't this, this isn't my image. My image is I love the people that beat me and crucified me. You can say you love God, but we've got to love man. And if you love man, you care about people that are lost. Jesus said there's two great commandments. Number one, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then it says in the second commandment, but in the Greek, it's saying as important as the first command. That's really what it says. The first command is to love God. The second command, as important as the first, is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, how can you not love your neighbor as you love yourself? If you're in the image of God and you're loving other people, you're loving God. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I said these are the two commandments. Focus on these and everything else will fall in place. See, that's the law. That's the commands Jesus wants to obey is to love. Mm -hmm. When you love God, you'll love others. You know, I like the idea that, you know, I've told people this before. I don't believe in Africans. I don't believe in Americans. I don't believe in Mexicans. I believe in heavenkins. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a bunch of heaven guns. And we need to get out there and start. Hello, we need to start stamping passports. Hallelujah. Because we're ambassadors. Hallelujah. For God. Amen. Hallelujah. I know Amen. I gave you a lot. I know I just probably overloaded you today. <clears throat> but uh, you got any questions? I know we covered a lot of ground. Not much questions, but uh, I just uh, love the way you finish it. This this commandment that we should love our neighbors, uh, the way we love ourselves, that means that God loves us the way he loves himself, just the way we've started when you were teaching us. So he commands us to do the same thing, to love others as we love ourselves, the way he loves us as okay. he loves himself. So yeah, that, that's so powerful. It has really blessed me. Yeah, Amen. just... Everything that you've spoken is just, you know, powerful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and that's not a burdensome command. His commands are not burdensome. They're not heavy. Mm. You know? Any other questions? Y'all are just like, I spoke to those pastors in Mexico. I think it's just, it's just the challenge of, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a wonderful challenge. I think that you've left us with, and especially, are we, are we, are we representing? Yes, yes. Are we representing? And then we need to understand that. And I think that's where we come in and begin to build our own small kingdoms. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Absolutely. You're right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so this is, it's, it's, it's a really good way to really, you know, refocus and, mm -hmm. and understand, you know, what his passion is. Mm -hmm. People. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amen. amen. And it has really spoken to me, really spoken to me. Because as, as, as just looking at, you know, some, some chapter revelation and looking at the church, and asking how God would be knocking at the door and he's, it's the church and he's knocking at the door. So I'm so encouraged that, you know, we could be misrepresenting and that's why he's actually standing at the door and knocking mm -hmm. because we began to do it our own way. And so it's a, it's a challenge. 
That's, that's a good word. You know, he, he's knocking on the door of the wrong embassy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Because if it was really his church, then he wouldn't be knocking. That's right. He'd be in there. <laughs> he would be mm. in there with us. So it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. So, and I've, I've been looking at that, and you know, this really just grounds me. Amen. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Amen. Anyone Amen. else have a word? I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> yes. I have a question. Uh huh. After after these teachings about evangelism, uh, the other day I was telling my my colleague that I feel I'm burning because uh, because of evangelism. But now, the way I'm feeling it is much important, mm -hmm. and the way the church is sleeping. What can we do? Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to 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 make our churches uh, awaken so that we can can do something because the church is sleeping totally sleeping now as we are learning this what can we do just do it. at least I've asked, that question, to... <laughs> I've asked that question myself for many years mm. and I think the answer is found in the word I think the church needs to fall back in love with Jesus. You know, the revelation, it said, uh, you've left your first love. Mm. And, I, and it doesn't say you lost it. A lot of people say many people have lost their first love. They didn't lose it. They left it. There's a big mm. difference of losing something and leaving something. So if mm. you lost it, you don't know where it is. But if you left it, you just have to go back and get it. <laughs> I think the church has left their first love and they have to go back to it and mm -hmm. when the church falls in love with Jesus that's the whole point of this teaching is we're going to love what Jesus loves which is souls mm. so until the church falls back in love with Jesus we're not going to be concerned about what Jesus is concerned about we're not going to love what Jesus loves which is people and evangelists mm. so that's a very good question amen Anyone Amen. Else? Amen. Pastor Don? Yes. I was just seeking clarification in a scripture that you mentioned uh, in John 14. You say that the, the commandments, of, commandments of God are not burdensome. Mm -hmm. Now, John 14, verse uh, 21 says, He who has my commandment, my commandments and keeps them, it is who it is he who loves me. Yes. Yeah. And you've said uh, we we take this. Most of the time, people take this uh, scripture out of context and put burdensome on people. Yes, yes. But, <laughs> now, when you go down there, uh, he, uh, the same scripture, he says, uh, verse 23, he says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Yes. And then when I go to Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 28, <laughs> the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. The Bible didn't say to those that God loves. Yes. It is to those who love God. Yes. Now, how do you know, how do you assess somebody who loves God? Huh. They're obeying his commands. Oh. They're loving hey. him. And when you love him, you obey him. Mm. How and do you God say is... it without being... Now, here, here's the, the, the question is, how you, do you, because I, I, how do you say it without making a person feel bad, burdened? How do you, I, I, I know that what it says, how do you appropriate it when, when sharing so that somebody does not feel condemned? Yeah, I think we need to focus on the love first and then the commands instead of the commands first and then the love. Oh, true. 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 See, you fall, see, <clears throat> I love my wife. So yeah. I don't need a command that says, do not beat her. Mm. <laughs> because I love her, I will not beat her. Yes. Amen. 
See, I don't have to obey the command, provide for my wife. I will do that yes. automatically because I love my wife. Mm. So what we do, like, for example, we want people to evangelize. So we use guilt. God commands you to evangelize. And so they get out and they do it and they hate it and they're miserable and they don't want to do it. <laughs> but when they fall in love with Jesus, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Uh -huh. Woo Amen. Mm -hmm. And it's true. And it's true. I think many a times we've tied obedience. Like, in fact, we also tie like obedience to look like it's a burden. Yeah. Okay. And it's the perspective instead of understanding that obedience is tied to love. Yes. That's the point right there, Sylvia. It's obedience is tied to love. Yes. Yeah. You know? And that's why, you know, if we look at it that way, even Isaiah, you know, the chapter one, verse 19, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Yeah. You know, yeah. so many a times we, I think there's a time you mentioned that you said, sometimes even like our upbringing and our perspective, if we know a father to be a disciplinarian, so every time we hear mm -hmm. about the father, with our perspective is anytime he comes to obedience, it's disciplinary discipline it's burden it's difficult mm -hmm. so but what but when we understand the love of the father and when we understand love then it's easier even for the person so even i think for as you said it's good to focus on the love so that even the individual can be able to receive it as 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 love yes you're absolutely right and that's why all the way see grace has to come first that's why all the way through the bible it says grace and truth amen never truth and grace amen if you get the truth before grace you'll be involved in legalism mm. but if you get grace before truth mm. you have freedom all right amen. all right and but, but what we do though is we pre we we love the law because we can get people we can manipulate people with the law so that's why Very we say, easy. you don't love God. You don't love God. You'd be out there winning souls. And so yeah. we manipulate them out of guilt and condemnation of which God said there is none of that for any of his children. But we use mm -hmm. condemnation by preaching the law to get them to do evangelism. And they're miserable. But when you fall in love with Jesus, all you have to do is teach them an effective way to do it because they want to do it. Mm -hmm. But we've gotten so far away from grace, we just preach law, 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 law. Mm -hmm. Legalism. Yes, a lot of legalism in the church today. Mm -hmm. A lot of legalism. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want God to do this, you have to do that. Oh my. I'm God's child. I'm the righteousness mm -hmm. of God in Jesus. I can't get any more righteous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You can't get any more love from him. He, he no. gave it all. Because he loves himself. Yes. <laughs> and that's why in the book of Ephesus, Ephesians, he said, uh, say the truth in love. Yes. It's yes. not just the truth. It's love. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you're right. Speak the truth in love. Yeah, but yeah. You know what we do? We speak the truth to manipulate. <laughs> and, and i've been guilty of it i mean i've been guilty of it i really have but you know what i don't want to present myself and i don't want to present my own kingdom i want to represent amen jesus. that's it and jesus loved even those that had just nailed him to the cross and said forgive them Amen. Well, that doesn't mean that God doesn't use discipline because we see church discipline in Corinthians and the Bible says that God disciplines his children. He corrects them. He doesn't punish. Because he loves. Because he loves us. Yes. Just like I disciplined my children when they were little. Why? Because I hated them? No, I disciplined them because I loved them. Amen. Because, because I want them to be on the right path. And so God wants to keep directing me. And, and, you know, correcting me, of course he wants to do that. He's a loving father. He loves himself. 